Today, 17th April 2024, at least as of the time of my making this programme, there has been no information of an Israeli strike on Iran or on Iranian targets or any of the retaliation by Israel following the Iranian strike on Iran that we're all expecting and which Israel has in effect promised. That doesn't of course mean that the retaliation or the strike from Israel won't come. What it means is that there's doubts and uncertainties within the Israeli government, probably arguments and quarrels and recriminations, and there's also doubtless much discussion with Israel's allies, with the United States first and foremost, which has made it quite clear that it does not want any Israel, Israeli strike or retaliation. And with the other G7 states, America's allies who weighed in on America's side and are also trying to persuade the Israelis to either call off whatever it is that they plan to do, or at least to try and scale it down so that the attack, if it comes, will be more symbolic than actual. I still expect an Israeli strike of some kind to come. I think that were there no strike at all, um, it would increase even further the political problems within Israel of Prime Minister Netanyahu, and it would probably increase the divisions within the Israeli cabinet. I think some kind of a strike will take place. What its scale will be remains to be seen. Now, there's been some information that I've now started to piece together about what has been going on over the last um, two weeks or so since the Israeli attack on the Iranian embassy building in Damascus, and I think we can draw a few conclusions about it. Firstly, it appears that after Iran appealed to the UN Security Council uh, following the strike on the embassy, Russia actually drafted a statement for the Security Council to publish, to issue, condemning the Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy building in Damascus. The United States apparently vetoed issue of the statement in the Security Council. Now, I think that was a mistake. <coughs> <coughs> Perhaps the <coughs> United States was not in a position to vote for a statement drafted by Russia. But I think it should have, at least in that case, published a statement of its own, produced its own counter-statement, or if it couldn't do that, it should have supported a counter-statement <coughs> prepared by one of its allies. That might have diffused the whole situation and prevented us drifting into this situation where we find ourselves in today, where the Iranians have launched a strike directly against Israel, and where we're all left wondering whether the Israelis in turn are going, going to launch their own strike <clears throat> against Iran. Anyway, one amongst many diplomatic mistakes made by the United States. We see again the effect of the US election. The president and his advisors do, are still very nervous of taking action in the United Nations that appears to be critical of Israel. They were severely criticized by Israel's friends in the United States after they allowed the earlier resolution to pass the Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire covering the period of the month of Ramadan um, in Gaza. 
Um, and as a result, they were nervous about supporting merely the issue of a statement from the Security Council, which could be seen by some as critical of Israel. As I said, I think that was a mistake. I think all that it has done is put the United States potentially in an even more difficult situation than it would have been if the statement had been issued. Anyway, that's one thing. The second is that there's more information gradually coming together about the Iranian strike and its consequences. There's been a long article about the Iranian strike in the Financial Times. It makes its, uh, its the headline of the article says Ukraine's air defense struggle highlights risks to Israel. Full-scale conflict has depleted Ukrainian defenses and Israel could face a similar plight despite successful interceptions. And the point the article is making, it's a very long article, but it can be summarized fairly quickly, is that the kind of air defense that Israel put up and its allies put up is unsustainable, that there are not enough interceptors in the world, air defense interceptors in the world, at least not in the Western world, to enable Israel to continue to um, parry Iranian strikes night after night over weeks and months, um, if that, of course, is what Iran would be prepared to do. Eventually, the Israeli defenses would be de depleted to the point that more and more Iranian missiles were able to penetrate the defenses, causing more and more damage, which is, of course, exactly what we're seeing happen in Ukraine. Now, I have to qualify that by making two observations. Firstly, we don't know how big Iran's stockpile of missiles and rockets and um, drones actually is. We're told, and the article says, that Tehran and its proxies, that means, I think, first and foremost Hezbollah, are sitting on a bank of missiles and drones estimated to number in the tens of thousands. Now, that would suggest that Iran's industrial capabilities in churning out missiles and drones is, and rockets is greater than Russia's. Now, that might be true. Of course, it may also be true that the Iranians have been stockpiling missiles and drones and rockets over many more years than Russia has. And it could also be the case that Iran's Drones and missiles and rockets are much simpler and more basic and cheaper than Russia's and therefore are much easier to produce. Having said that, I think tens of thousands is an awful lot of drones and missiles. And I'd like to see some proof that Iran really does have capabilities on that kind of scale. That's the first thing I must say. The second is, of course, that the reality is that if Iran were pounding Israel night after night in that kind of a way, then we would get a response, not just from Israel, but from the United States and other countries. Israel itself, of course, is a nuclear power. Um, we would be looking at a situation of an escalating war this scenario of the Israelis simply sitting and absorbing the blow night after night until their air defense shield becomes exhausted is hardly, or so it seems to me, a realistic one. Having said that, it does point to a number of important facts, which is that the cost... $1.3 billion, we're told, of the air defense that Israel mounted um, over the course 
of the Iranian attack was inordinately high. I read a comment on Slavyangrad, Russian telegram channel, but probably, um, well, I mean, they're extremely insightful commentators and they know an awful lot about this kind of thing. Anyway, they estimated, or someone writing for them estimated, that over the course of the night, Israel expended 50% of its air defense missiles that were loaded onto its air defense batteries. Doesn't mean, of course, that Israel doesn't have uh, many more air defense missiles in reserve, but 50% were already, 50% of those that were ready for launch were already used up. Another attack on the same scale would have used up another, would have used them all up. The Israelis would then have been in a position to have to reload. They would have had to reload. The cost would have grown even further. We would be looking at, at presumably three billion dollars, four billion dollars. Um, it might act not actually take very long for the Israeli air defense system to be depleted. And of course, presumably, whilst the reloads of the missiles were taking place, gaps in the coverage would emerge, which would enable more missiles, more Iranian missiles to get through. So, you know, this isn't something that we can discount or write off altogether. On the contrary, it does show why an attrition war between Israel and Iran, even an Israel which is the backing of the Western powers, is something which a wise Israeli government would want to avoid, even with all the other qualifications that I've just given about the true size of the Iranian stockpile, which we don't know, and the likely counteraction that Iran would take counteraction by uh, Israel would take counteraction which by the way would probably not be difficult easy to put it mildly and um, which might come with economic military and political costs and losses of its own just saying so anyway that's the second thing that i think has become clear over the last uh, couple of days last few hours specifically. The third is that I agree with the British commentator David Hurst, which is that Israel made a major mistake in talking up Jordan's cooperation in shooting down Iranian drones. Other Arab states apparently took a decision, the Gulf monarchies took a decision, that they were not going to um, highlight or publicize whatever assistance to the Western powers and even Israel they might have privately given. On the contrary, they have been going out of their way to keep as great a distance between themselves and Israel as possible. Saudi Arabia has, of course, recently achieved a rapprochement with Iran, which it almost certainly does not want to risk. And anyway, the other Arab states have been very, very careful to play down whatever private help they might have provided. I think the Jordanian government will not have been pleased that the Israelis, in effect, outed it to the extent that um, they did. The fact that Jordan apparently allowed Israel and its Western allies to use its airspace to shoot down um, Iranian drones and missiles could not be concealed from the Arab public or the Jordanian public and was controversial in itself. But the, the Jordanian military actually shot down drones and missiles well, one can understand why a vulnerable 
small and vulnerable country like Jordan might have felt obliged to do that and might have come under enormous pressure from the United States in particular to do that. But I think that given how controversial it was bound to be within Jordan itself and in the wider Arab world, I think that the Jordanians would not have been pleased to have the fact that their, their own military actually participated in shorting, shooting down the drones and the missiles publicised. And in fact, in the hours since that information came to light, the Jordanian government has been making one statement after another, trying to limit the political damage and giving hints that its future cooperation cannot be relied upon in the same way. So that's another thing I wanted to say. And then the last thing is this, which is that we are starting to get a few little glimmers of information about the effectiveness of the strike itself. Um, yesterday, we were very fortunate on the Duran to do a live stream with the uh, former CIA um, official and analyst Larry Johnson. And he made the point that if the damage carried done by the strike to the Iranian faci uh, Israeli facilities has been as slight as we have been told, we would probably have been provided with some film evidence or photographic evidence to confirm that. Um, that's not happened. On the contrary, we're getting dribbles of information, mainly satellite pictures and the rest, which do suggest that a certain amount of damage was done. I don't want to um, overstate the amount. Despite vehement denials from some quarters, it's absolutely clear to me it's been acknowledged in many places in the Western media. It was already indicated by that article that appeared on the 12th of April in the Financial Times, the one that took place before the Iranian missile strike were launched. It is clear that more than anything else, this strike by Iran was intended to demonstrate resolve and capability rather than inf inflict significant damage. However, it seems that some actual damage was done. Some missiles, some of them, doubtless the Fatah twos I talked about in my program yesterday, did get through, and that must be affecting American and indeed Israeli calculations about what to do next. So we'll see what the Israelis do. Now, the latest report suggests that Israel might have decided, after all, that it was not going to strike at targets within Iran itself, that it was going to return to doing the usual things that it was doing before, striking Hezbollah and the various um, um, militias that are aligned to Iran. I can't really see what significant or substantial difference that's going to make. Be, effectively a return to business as usual. There might be cyber attacks, there might be all sorts of things like that. But absent a actual strike on Iran itself, I think if the Israelis can find themselves to doing that, there will be within Israel a sense of letdown and disappointment. There will be a wider feeling across the Middle East that the Iranians have called Israel's bluff, and by the way, the bluff of the United States. For that reason, I have to say, I think that some kind of a Israeli strike on Iran remains more likely than not. But we will have to see. To reiterate again, a point I have made many times, if the only reason 
for launching a strike is to preserve face, then it would be better if it were not done. If the intention is to demonstrate deterrent capability, well, I think Israel has it in abundance. It is, after all, a nuclear power. Now, yesterday I said in a program that I had been given information about the fact that Iran itself possesses capabilities that I'm not prepared to discuss. I'm not prepared to discuss the information that was given. The information, by the way, comes from Russia. And apparently it is detailed and it is widely held and believed within Russia itself. About all of that, I have absolutely no doubt. I'm not here second-guessing this information, which I'm not in any kind of position to do. All I would say is that I don't want to start speculating about capabilities that Iran has not demonstrated, because I think to do so at a time like this, when the situation in the Middle East is already fraught, would be frankly irresponsible and might actually um, aggravate the situation. I say that with full awareness that, of course, this channel, this program, has only a certain audience. I mean, I'm not reaching into every home in Israel or the Middle East or Iran or wherever. But I have always believed that even allowing for that, <laughs> I should not say things which might make a bad situation worse, even if the likelihood of people noticing what one has said is small. And that's the only reason why I'm not going to discuss these capabilities. I don't know. I want to stress this again. I know what the Russians believe or think they believe. Um, I don't know whether those Russian beliefs are necessarily true. All I will say is I don't want to discuss those capabilities which might, as I said, make the situation in the Middle East conceivably even more fraught than it already is. And that's the only reason why I'm not talking about this subject. I say that because a number of people have come and have asked why am I not being rather forthcoming, rather more forthcoming. Um, it doesn't, this information, by the way, I should also say this, does not change in any way my own fundamental analysis of how we've got to this point of what the Iranians have been doing of what the Americans want to see happen and of Israel's own moves. So I don't see that it adds anything to my existing analysis. Um, it would perhaps look at the situation further down the line and I don't want to go there. I don't want to take steps which might either intensify or might be seen as leading to certain th steps being taken which might intensify an already very difficult situation. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about the situation between Israel and Iran today. We're just going to have to wait and see what happens over the next few days. I still believe that an Israeli strike of some kind is inevitable. I still believe that it is more likely than not going to be against Iran itself. What the Iranians are going to do in response, we shall see. One point I do want to make, however, and again it flows directly from what Larry Johnson said on the live stream we did with him on the Duran yesterday. And Larry Johnson has made the point that the United States and its mighty navy have proved incapable of keeping the Red Sea open in the face of attacks from the Houthi militia in Yemen. 
And I have to say that I completely agree with one further point which he also made, which is that if the United States can't keep sea lanes through the Red Sea open against a militia like the Houthis, the idea that the United States Navy can keep the Straits of Hormuz open in the event that Iran were to take a decision to close them. I think that is, frankly, fanciful. Of course, if the Iranians do indeed possess the capability to strike at US Navy carriers, and as I said in my program yesterday, that seems to me to be the ultimate purpose of missiles like the Fateh II, well, then, of course, the US Navy is going to be even more reluctant to try to prevent Iran from closing the Straits of Hormuz. I am not saying that that is something that the Iranians themselves want to do. They have returned to the oil market in a big way. Um, over the last few years, they're selling substantial amounts of oil to China and Iran. That has helped Iran refloat its economy. It partly explains why Iran is achieving, as I understand it, around 7% growth. I cannot imagine that the Iranians, therefore, want to interrupt the oil flow through the Persian Gulf. And I can't imagine, therefore, that the Iranians are in all keen to close the Straits of Hormuz. All I would say is that the actions of the Houthis have, to all intents and purposes, put the Iranian capability to close the Straits of Hormuz beyond all possible doubt. Anyway, let's move on and let's turn to that other war, the conflict in Ukraine. The first thing to say is that this morning, reports trickled in that Ukraine has carried out another major strike against a Russian airfield, in fact, the big Junkov airfield in Crimea, using Atakam's cruise missiles. Now, the very last package of assistance provided by the United States um, some weeks ago, the one that they said um, used up the last bits and bobs of funding left over from the previous appropriations included HIMARS rockets and, as I said, Attackham's missiles. And, as I said at the time, Attackham's missiles. And we see that the Ukrainians have now used those missiles on in this attack on this air base. Now, there's a lot of discussions and debate about what happened over the course of this attack. The Ukrainians themselves claiming that they successfully destroyed um, S-300 and S-400 uh, anti-aircraft missile bases that the Russians have positioned around this air base. Riba, who takes an extremely negative view, I should say, of the Russian Defense Ministry and who likes to position himself as a kind of Russian Cassandra, always taking the most pessimistic view of any particular situation, gives a rather more moderate account. He says that um, some damage was done. Um, I'll actually um, read what he says. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian military launched an attack on the airfield in Jankoy. Around 12 Attackham's missiles were utilized for the strike, likely originating from Kherson region. The assault was executed in two phases. The initial strike involved seven missiles, seemingly equipped with cluster warheads, whilst the second wave was employed, were deployed, wave deployed at least five. Some equipment at the airfield sustained damage, at least along with one of the buildings. Now, that does not mention successful destruction of air defense missiles. There's no reference here, by the way, either from the Ukrainians or from the um, um, from Reba about the Russian air defense system successfully 
intercepting any of these attack and missiles. The usual story with missiles is that when they are first introduced, the Russians have to work out how to shoot them down. It usually takes a number of strikes before the Russians have fully understood the parameters of any particular missile. But then gradually the air defense system, the Russian air defense system, cranks into operation and more and more missiles um, are shot down. Um, a good illustration of this is the gradual eclipse of the storm shadow and the scalp. Um, a number of these missiles, quite a large number of these missiles, got through in the initial strikes when they were first deployed with every further use of these storm shadow and scalp missiles their effectiveness has declined as the Russian air defense system has become more successful in intercepting them. One thing I will say, and it's a point that Reba is making, and I Dima at the Military Summary Channel has also made, is that this strike with these 12 missiles, if that was the number that was used, is surely not the main strike that the Ukrainians intend to carry out using these missiles. The main strike will presumably be against the Crimean Bridge, which a variety of Ukrainian officials, including Kirill Budanov and I believe Zelensky himself, has said that U Ukraine intends to destroy in the first half of this year. So the Russians and the Ura Ukrainians are testing out these attackers missiles. The Russians will be taking steps to uh, reinforce the defences of the bridge in anticipation of the strike on the bridge, which surely is coming. And the Ukrainians themselves will be testing and trying to understand the capabilities of these attack of missiles prior to the strike on the bridge. I'm going to say one point, it does seem that this particular strike was again carried out using cluster munitions, cluster warheads. And the reports, which we can't fully rely on, suggest that the Attackham's missiles that were supplied to Ukraine basically use cluster warheads, are, are exclusively missiles which use cluster warheads. If so, then I doubt that they can destroy the bridge. Um, in order to destroy a structure as large and strong as the Crimean Bridge, you would certainly need to use missiles with big, unitary, high-explosive warheads. Um, cluster mu munitions don't seem to me to be really appropriate for that kind of for that kind of attack. Perhaps the Ukrainians are planning something more ambitious, a more complex attack from various directions. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Now, so far, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the Russian Defense Ministry has not provided any information about this attack. Maybe they never will. Um, Russian telegram channels have said virtually nothing about it at least not so far. Um, it doesn't appear to be affecting Russian capabilities, um, the operations of their air force. And I would also add that if 12 Attackums missiles were indeed used in this attack, then it's quite likely that a significant part of the stockpile, of the Attackums stockpile, has already been expended in this one attack. An attack on the bridge itself is likely to be much more difficult. Anyway, we will have to see and wait and see what the Ukrainians do. This is obviously a dramatic and important development. And as I said, we will have to await 
the developments as they come. One observation I am going to make, however, is that even during that discussion of those German generals, officers, talking about an attack on the Crimean Bridge by Taurus missiles, the admission, there was the admission that the bridge itself is barely used any longer by the Russian military for logistical purposes. And we've had lots of reports that this new railway, land, this railway across land, that the Russians have built towards Crimea through the land bridge is now all but complete and likely to be about to enter operations. An attack on the bridge, even if it is successful, at this stage of the war, is going to be purely symbolic. It's going to be something done to lift morale in Ukraine, which is sagging as it becomes clear, as it is becoming increasingly clear to the Ukrainian people that the war is being lost that the Russians are moving towards a clear-cut and decisive victory. And we should not be um, misled by this. The Ukrainians have launched many attacks on Russian Navy ships, on the Black Sea Fleet. I doubt, as I've said many times, I think that the effectiveness of these attacks has been massively overstated in the Western media and indeed even by some Russian commentators. Um, the attacks on the Crimean Bridge, it's the same. These are mostly demonstrative attacks intended to raise morale, both in Ukraine and in the West. The actual military realities on the battlefronts continue to go, continue to weigh badly against Ukraine. In fact, as we'll now come to discuss, the situation on the battlefronts is becoming straightforwardly catastrophic. Now let's turn to the situation on the battlefronts. But before we do, can I just say that there was apparently another missile strike by the Russians of some kind across Ukraine yesterday. These missile strikes have now become so routine that it's difficult to keep track on, of them. And from what I can gather, it, this particular missile strike was more focused on destroying Ukrainian military facilities, depots, ammunition dumps, that kind of thing, rather than attacking the energy system as such or other things of that nature. So I'm not going to discuss it further, at least until I have more precise information as to what exactly the Russians are doing. There are lots of reports circulating that two days ago, a major Russian missile strike on some kind of headquarters building in Slavyansk and a similar missile strike, Russian missile strike, on a some kind of headquarters building in the town of Chuguyev um, in Kharkiv region. Now, these two strikes together killed hundreds of Ukrainian um, personnel, including large, including a, a significant number of senior officers. And there's even some very bold claims that no less a person than Kirill Budanov and perhaps General Tatarsky, the, uh, uh, sorry, not General Tatarsky, uh, um, the general, I've just, his name has just escaped me, who has been commanding the Ukrainian forces in the south, in, in Zaporozhye region, that the, these two senior Ukrainian officials, Budanov specifically, have either been killed or wounded in these strikes. Well, suffice to say that we have no confirmation of this, none at all from a, any Ukrainian source. I remember last year there were all kinds of claims that Zeluzhny and Budanov had been killed in similar strikes. Zeluzhny 
and Budanov turned up alive and well. There was some mystery in both cases. I remember Zaluzhny giving a very strange, eerie interview in which he frankly came across looking rather depressed. Budanov, I suspect, was caught up in a Russian missile attack and might have been wounded over the course of it. There were rumours that he'd been rushed to Germany and had received treatment there. And we've seen how he apparently um, spends much of his time in darkened rooms, which some people see as a security precaution, but which I wonder whether that isn't an effect, the effect part of uh, an effect arising from his injuries as a result of this attack. Anyway, one way or the other, uh, we saw those reports last year that these that senior officers had been killed, but until we know for a fact that they have been killed, um, I'm going to assume that Budanov and General Tarnavsky, and now I remember his name correctly, um, I'm going to assume that they're still alive until I see confirmation that they're dead. Last year, as I said, both Zaluzhny and Budanov turned up, perhaps not alive and well, but still alive. And in this case, as I said, until we get confirmation that they have been wounded or are killed, I'm going to assume that they're still alive. But anyway, that's enough about Russian missile strikes at the moment. What is happening on the battlefronts? Well, the situation for the Ukrainians continues to deteriorate, and it's deteriorating fast. And the worst news, the place where the situation is becoming most obviously disastrous, is in the Avdeevka area. Now, yesterday, I said that there were reports that the Russians had reached and had broken into Ocheretino on the railway. I said that I wasn't sure that this was the case, that it might be that people were confusing the Zarya Dacha community along the railway south of Ocheretino for Ocheretino itself. But I also, as I recall, said that in recent weeks, um, it has often turned out to be the case that reports of the furthest possible Russian advance have turned out to be the correct reports, that the Russians are ahead of where most people suppose them to be. Well, this morning we got confirmation that the Russians have indeed reached and in fact have broken in to Ocheretino, that there is now fighting going on in the southern buildings of this village that the Russians are advancing on apparently it's called Ivan Franco Street within this village and that the fighting for Ocheretino is already underway. This is a very very rapid advance along the railway and to reiterate again Ocheretino is a strategic location if the Russians are able to capture it then, because it is on a hill, and it, because it is an important railway hub, it affects Ukraine's communications, and it opens up the um, area, the entire area around, to potential control by the Russians. So this is very big news. There is also news from other parts of the Avdevka front lines. There's some reports that the Russians have now resumed their advance up the H-20 road, further east from Ocheretino, um, that they're in, and that they might even be attacking now Novokalinova and perhaps Keramik as well. Again, this isn't wholly confirmed, but we can see that the Russian advance north of Avdevka is gaining 
ever greater momentum. And there's also more reports that the Russians have not only cut the roads uh, south uh, from not, um, not only reached Novo Bakhmutivka, this village to the west of the railway, and cut the roads to the south of Novo Bakhmutivka, in effect placing the 47th, the Ukrainian 47th mechanized brigade clinging on to the area around Berdichi under a form of operational encirclement, but that they're now attacking the village of Novo Bakhmutivka itself at the same time as they're attacking Ocheretino. So it does look as if there is not just an operational crisis um, north of Abdevka for the Ukrainians, but the early stages of what looks like a decisive defeat in this area as well. And that's to the north of Avdevka, to the south and west of Avdevka, it is the same. I've said in the past that the fall of Pervomaisky would lead to the inevitable collapse of Ukrainian resistance in Krasnogorovka, further south. There's now lots of reports that the Russians are pushing, advancing south from um, Krasnogorovka towards, um, sorry, south from Pervomaisky towards Krasnogorovka. Apparently, those reports have now been confirmed. There are reports that Ukrainian, some Ukrainian troops um, located to the east of this advance are at risk of being trapped inside a pocket or cauldron, that they're trying to escape through whatever lines of retreat still exist. To be clear, again, I think that the ultimate direction of the Russian advance from Bergomaisky will be towards Krasnogorovka itself and with the purpose of cutting the roads leading into Krasnogorovka. Now, there has been an astonishing film um, circulating of a Russian armoured vehicle, heavily protected, um, entering the central area of Krasnogorovka, driving around, uh, doesn't appear to be engaging in any kind of military action itself. There's no sign of it um, um, releasing troops, deploying troops, or opening fire on any Ukrainian positions. It seems to be just driving around what looked like deserted streets and then returning unscathed and not attacked to the Russian lines. Now, there's been a lot of discussion and speculation about what this means. One claim is that the Russians have um, actually captured this area through which this armoured vehicle was um, driving. It's possible. Another is that this was some kind of a reconnaissance intended to um, oblige the Ukrainians to open fire on this armoured vehicle, exposing its position to the Russians. Now that would suggest that the armoured vehicle and the Russian personnel operating it, were dispatched on what was in effect a suicide mission. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that that is how the Russian uh, military works. I, I, I'm sure that um, the intention was for the personnel on this vehicle to survive. If they could, obviously, there's always a risk in battle that people will die. But I don't think that they were sent on a one-way mission simply to expose the positions of Ukrainian defenders. I'm just saying. I think that what has probably happened is that the Ukrainians have pulled out of this area 
and that the Russians had got wind of the fact and that the vehicle was dispatched to enter this area and to establish whether that is actually true. And I think that the vehicle entered into this central part of Krasnogorovka, drove around, waiting to see whether there would be a Ukrainian response, found that there was none, went deeper into this central area of Krasnogorovka, and then eventually received the order to pull back. And I think what this episode demonstrates is that with Pervomaisky having fallen, with the roads now threatened, with being cut off, with Ukrainian troops further north in this pocket that is being created as a result of the Russian advance south from Pervomaisky with the Ukrainian troops in this pro pocket probably also withdrawing. Ukrainian troops who have been stationed defending Krasnogorovka have at least pulled out at least of its, from its central area. Now, it may be that the pullback is even bigger, that the Ukrainians have decided to pull out of Krasnogorovka entirely that would not be <laughs> consistent with their previous actions but it seems to me that we are seeing some kind of pullback by the Ukrainians from their previous positions in Krasnogorovka and I think that is what this whole extraordinary episode demonstrates and to repeat again part of the reason that this has happened is the intense bombing by the Russians of Ukrainian positions in precisely this area, but principally it is because of concerns that the supply roads to Krasnogorovka are soon going to be cut following the fall of Pervomaisky. Now, there is of course a further possibility. We have seen increasingly that Ukrainian military units are not resisting with the same determination that they were res with which they were resisting earlier in the war. We've had these rather garbled reports of a collapse by the 25th Airborne Brigade in the Toninka Vodanya area west of Avdevka. The Russian Defense Ministry spoke of only nine soldiers from this brigade having surrendered, but others have hinted, and Zelensky himself has hinted, that many more did so, and there's reports that an entire battalion from this brigade actually surrendered en masse to the Russians, around 200 men, um, leading to the collapse of Ukrainian defences west of Toninka, where, of course, that big... Russian armor defensive had taken place. We've had reports that the 67th Brigade, um, another Ukrainian brigade, which was been fighting in the Chasov Yar area, that it too abandoned positions, acting without orders. We've had reports that the 3rd Assault Brigade, the Azov Brigade, has refused to take positions in Chasov Yar after refusing orders to um, earlier, um, a couple of weeks ago, to mount a counterattack immediately prior to the fall of Avdevka. It could be that if there's been a general retreat by Ukrainian troops in Krasnogorovka, this has happened as part of this process of Ukrainian units increasingly taking the initiative and pulling back by themselves and not waiting for, for orders from Kiev before they do it. Now, again, I don't want to say that this is what has actually happened 
in Krasnogorovka, because of course I don't know, but at least it seems to me to be a possibility. One way or the other, it looks like Krasnogorovka, the fighting in Krasnogorovka, is probably moving towards its conclusion. As I said, with Pervomaisky having fallen, I don't see how Krasnogorovka can be defended. And someone, perhaps Sirsky in Kiev, perhaps some other official, maybe Tarnavsky, if he's still alive, <laughs> or perhaps the local brigade commanders in Krasnogorovka, or perhaps some of the soldiers acting on their own initiative, appear to be making, drawing the obvious conclusions, and are pulling back. Anyway, we'll see what happens. More reports also are coming in. They're less clear about what's going on um, west of Torninka and um, Orlovka and places like um, Umanske and Jasnobrodovka and Natalovo. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of reports that the Russians are now fighting their way through Natalovo. Here it seems that the Ukrainians still are putting up some resistance. F fierce fighting continues to take place there. Um, lots of reports that the Russians have also entered these two other villages. Um, fighting is still going on. But for the moment, at least, the big news is coming from the north, from Ocheretina and the areas around and from the south, from Krasnogorovka and the areas around. And perhaps that means that the fighting in the Tylevo and Jasnobrodovka and um, Umanske, which might be every bit as important, is getting less attention. And therefore we're getting less information about it. Bear in mind that a couple of days ago we got reports, rather visual confirmation, that the Russians already control most of Semyonovka, this village immediately to the north of Orlovka, between Orlovka and Berdichi. The Russians for some time, at least, have controlled most of Berdichi, the 47th Mechanized Brigade, which has been defending Berdichi for some time now, one of the most elite units of the Ukrainian military, um, at risk <coughs> of encirclement if Novobakhmutivka, further north, is captured by the Russians and perhaps already facing significant supply issues. If the road, the supply road, has already been cut, it looks to me, just to summarise, as if we are starting to see the early signs of collapse in this part of the front lines. As I said um, yesterday, the Russians appear to be punching a hole through Ukrainian defences in what has historically been the most heavily defended and most heavily fortified part of the Ukrainian defence lines in Donbass. And if the Russians are able to punch through this hole, if they're able to shatter Ukrainian defences completely, if the front lines, in other words, here completely collapse. And I think we might be closer to that point than people realise. Though, you know, maybe the Ukrainians will find some means to change the situation. General Sirsky might still have some troops that he can rush to positions to take, to plug the gap here. Anyway, if this hole, if this gap in the defence lines um, opens up, then, to be clear, it looks to me 
as if this will undermine the entire Ukrainian defense system in central Donbass. Now, this is the news that we're getting from Avdevka. There's lots of news also coming from um, the Bakhmut area, from Chasovia. It's clear the fighting there is very, very intense. It's not quite as easy to get the full information from Chasov Yar that we have had from Avdevka. Perhaps because the battle for Chasov Yar is still at an earlier stage than, say, the battle for Krasnogorovka is, and perhaps because the Russians also still have less operational space. There are still Ukrainian troops west of the canal in the micro district and uh, around Kleshevka and Andreevka and the fighting therefore continues to be a lot more complicated. The direction of travel in Chasov Yar however remains clear. Sierski is right is rushing reinforcements to Chasov Yar, desperate to try to hold Ukrainian positions there. There were reports yesterday and the day before that the Russians had positioned troops to the west of the micro district along the canal, that they had in effect actually physically established control of the roads leading into the micro district across the canal from the main part of Chasov Yar. Um, what was said to be photographic evidence of this was, or film evidence of this was produced. It looks as at the time of making this program that that report was wrong that the film evidence was a case of the Ukrainians perhaps engaging in friendly fire, as happens in every war, against some of their own forces located on the east bank of the canal, and that the Russians have not actually reached this position, but that they are gradually tightening their vice around Chasov Yar, that their forces are advancing and will probably be crossing the canal fairly soon as they advance from Bogdanovka and through this hill and <laughs> presumably eventually capture Kalinina and probably as they advance from Ivanivska as well, and also across the canal from the south. Well, all of that seems to me to be only a question of time. And, of course, it's also only a question of time before resistance in the micro-district itself collapses. Though it seems that there are no Russian troops immediately to the west of the micro district controlling the main roads controlling the road rather into the micro district it's clear to me that that road is all but unusable by the ukrainians the russians have aerial dominance they can shell the road they can also operate drones over the road they're in a very very strong position to intercept supplies along that road. The micro district is effectively encircled and it is only a question of time before it falls. So another potential crisis for the Ukrainians in that area as well. Now less news today about what's going on around Siversk and in the south around Kurachovo, Marinka, Vuglada, Novomikhailovka. Lots of reports at various times about Novomikhailovka having fallen. Reports this morning that the Ukrainians still clinging on to a few buildings to the very 
edge, western edge of novel Mikhailovka. Russians taking time to complete their clearing of this village, it seems. But anyway, um, to reiterate again, what is going on in these places, in, Novo, in Siversk and Vogleda, they are probably the big, they're probably the, will become the focus of major Russian military operations. Once this hole that the Russians are trying to punch through the defences in the Avdavka area has been you know, punched through, has been established, and once Chasovya falls. But we're still looking at the Russians shaping the battlefield, if you like, to use the American expression, in these two areas. And elsewhere, fighting continues to happen on a sporadic basis in the Zaporozhye region around Rabotino. Apparently, the Russians gradually gaining more and more territory in the former Bradley Square. There are some claims that that ultimately threatens the Ukrainian troops defending the northern part of Rabotino with encirclement, but well, we'll see. Anyway, a lot of that, what going, what's going on there, what's going on around Kupiansk, for the moment, these remain sideshows. The main battles happening in Avdevka, principally around Avdevka, principally west of Avdevka, and probably before long, Chasofya as well. But a clear operational crisis for the Ukrainians. Now, we have had the another article in Politico, and it is the starkest about the war from a Ukrainian perspective and a Western perspective so far. And its title could not be more straightforward. Ukraine is heading for defeat. And it is by Jamie Detmer in Kiev. And the subtitle is, well, it tells one everything one needs to know about what the Western narrative, once that defeat happens, is going to be. The West's failure to send weapons to Kiev is helping Putin win his war. And um, we're told that it's not just that Ukraine's forces are running out of ammunition. Western delays over sending aid mean the country's dangerously short of something even harder to supply than shells, the fighting spirit required to win. Morale among troops is grim, ground down by relentless bombardment, a lack of advanced weapons, and losses on the battlefield. In cities hundreds of wet miles away from the front, the crowds of young men who lined up to join the army in the war's early months have disappeared. Nowadays, eligible would-be recruits dodge the draft and spend their afternoons in nightclubs instead. I frankly have to say this. I find this endless harping one finds in articles after articles, both in the American, Western and uh, Ukrainian media about young people in Ukraine partying in nightclubs as the soldiers die on the battlefront. I find these articles very, very distasteful. They suggest a callousness on the part of young Ukrainians, which I don't believe remotely exists. And what it's basically saying to them is that they shouldn't be idling their time in nightclubs they should be getting massacred on the front lines in Ukraine, which it seems to me is a completely inappropriate thing to say. But anyway, that's my little <laughs> comment on this. I just wanted to say, but anyway, there we are. Anyway, going on, the article goes on to say, as I discovered whilst reporting from Kiev over the past month, the picture that emerged from dozens of interviews with political leaders, military officers 
and ordinary citizens was one of a country slipping towards disaster. Even as President Zelensky says Ukraine is trying to find a way not to retreat, military officers privately accept that more losses are inevitable this summer. The only question is how bad they will be. Vladimir Putin has arguably, arguably never been closer um, to achieving his goal. And we go on. If the tide doesn't turn soon in this third year of Russia's invasion, it will be the nation of Ukraine as it currently exists that is consigned to the past. So there we go. Um, long admissions about military disaster. But, again, the whole explanation for this is Western weaponry, that there isn't enough of it, which is undoubtedly true, but that the West isn't supplying enough, that it has, in effect, made a decision not to supply enough weapons. And, by the way, we now see again inflation of Ukrainian demands. Right now, Ukraine's most urgent need is for artillery shells, millions of them. Ukraine say it says it needs at least two dozen Patriot air defense systems. So we've gone from seven to seven batteries to two dozen, 24 Patriot air defense systems. That's effectively what Zelensky was asking for. In other words, 150 to 200 batteries of Patriot missile systems. As J.D. Vance correctly pointed out, there aren't that many Patriot air defense missiles. There aren't that many shells. This is what Western commentators covering this war, and this person from Politico, Mr. Dietmar, simply refuse to understand or accept or are in total denial about. And then we read, for example, think things like the fears about the fragility of the front lines are only compounded by an unprecedented barrage of Russian attacks intended to knock out Ukraine's electricity networks and give us the Patriots, Kaleva says, as if it were that easy. People always, as I said, come back to this question of money, the complicated maneuvers in Congress about getting the $61 billion. If the weapon systems, the interceptors were there in the numbers that were needed, they would have been supplied to Ukraine Financial problems are not the insuperable barrier that people constantly make out. Of course, the United States could give a loan to Ukraine. That's now been talked about, by the way. Um, Speaker Johnson has come up with a very elaborate and very complicated plan about how to support Ukraine. Eight billion dollars to support its economy. Fourteen billion dollars in the form of a loan for Ukraine to buy weapons from the United States, everything else, all the other parts of the appropriation, the $61 billion, to be used instead to rebuild US arsenals already critically depleted as a result of the war in Ukraine. Um, it's actually a very interesting package. Um, I'm far from clear whether the administration will accept it. Many people in the Republican caucus are furious about it and are pushing back against it. We will see whether Speaker Johnson, who's now threatened with loss of his job, is prepared to go ahead with a package like this. But one way or the other, to repeat, whatever the problems the United States might have finding money. Those problems do not exist in Europe. Certainly, budgets in Europe are massively overextended. 
there are critical shortages, there are critical deficits in pretty much all European countries now. And um, the debt problems in Europe are escalating and perhaps even close to getting out of control. But the one thing we have repeatedly seen is that the one thing the Europeans are always prepared to find money for is money for Ukraine. They can certainly put together a package of $61 billion if they want to. And if they wanted to, they could do that and buy all the weapons that Ukraine needed from the United States with that money. The reason they are not doing that is because they know the weapons aren't there. The millions of shells that Mr. Dietmar is talking about do not exist. The hundreds of Patriot systems, the 25, 24 Patriot systems that Zelensky is demanding, there aren't that many in the world. As J.D. Vance has pointed out, the United States produces 550 Patriot missile interceptors a year. If the $61 billion package is passed, it might increase that number to 650. That is nowhere near enough to meet Ukraine's needs, and it's certainly nowhere near enough to meet Ukraine's needs and Israel's too, and Saudi Arabia's and Taiwan's, and those of the United States also, and those of the United States' NATO allies. But, of course, this isn't something that these commentators want to accept or understand. And we nonetheless see in this article, in Politico, admissions about the realities of the situation in Ukraine. Several senior Ukrainian officers talked to Politico only on the understanding they would not be named so they could talk freely. They painted a grim forecast of front lines potentially collapsing this summer with, when Russia, with greater weight of numbers and a readiness to accept huge casualties, launches its expected offensive. As we see in the Avdevka area, there are now clear signs of collapse already. Just saying. But anyway, let's accept this. Perhaps worse, they expressed private fears that Ukraine's own resolve could be weakened with morale in the armed forces undermined by a desperate shortage of supplies. Ukrainian commanders are crying out for more combat soldiers. One estimate from the former top commander Valery Zaluzhny suggested they need an extra 500,000. But Zelensky and the Ukrainian parliament are hesitant about ordering a massive French fresh call-up. In an interview with Politico, Yermak, the powerful head of office of the president of Ukraine, offered an important and to outsiders perhaps surprising reason for not launching a mass mobilization. Such a call-up wouldn't have the backing of the people. And there's the rub. The West has failed to come up with what's needed, and it in turn is undermining Ukraine's will to do what it takes. Ukraine cannot do what it takes. It was unreasonable. It made no sense at all. It was cruel to ask it to. It was cruel to deceive the Ukrainians by telling them that the West could supply them with all the military equipment, all the ammunition, the missiles, the interceptors, the tanks, the shells, that it would need in order to prevail. The reality is, and this is something which I have been saying, Brian Baletic has been saying, Daniel Davis has been saying, Alex Machinin has been saying, so many people have now been saying, the reality is that the Western powers provided Ukraine with all the military supplies and equipment that they thought Ukraine would need in order to win the war. They did that 
because they had a completely false understanding of Russian resources. They assumed that Russian resources and Russian willpower was far weaker and far less than it actually is. And the result is that now that they found that the Russian resources are multiples greater than they imagined, they have been found, they have been called short. I remember many months ago, Vladimir Putin, no less, actually making exactly this point. He said that Ukraine doesn't have the resources to continue this war by itself, that it depends entirely on the West to do that, that that is an unsustainable position for any country to find itself in, and that sooner or later that external support would run out. He was, of course, completely right, and that is where we now are. Anyway, that is the article from Politico, and it reflects the realities of the war on the battlefront. Meanwhile, I have to now turn to a fascinating meeting in Beijing between Chancellor Scholz of Germany and President Xi Jinping of China. It's one of the most ferocious put-downs, lectures I've ever seen from the Chinese given to a Western leader about the West's Ukraine policies. And in it, Xi Jinping went out of his way to make absolutely clear to um, Olaf Scholz that he thought that the entire policy that Germany has been following towards Ukraine has been completely misconceived. Now, <laughs> it's difficult to do full justice to what um, Xi Jinping said, but we're told that Xi Jinping um, effectively um, gave a lecture to um, Schultz setting out the things that needed to be done to resolve the Ukraine crisis. And this is what Xi Jinping said. President Xi underscored that under current circumstances, all parties should commit to an early restoration of peace to prevent the conflict from escalating and even spiraling out of control. To this end, a number of principles should be followed. First, focusing on the overall interest of peace and stability rather than seeking selfish gains. Second, cooling down the situation rather than adding fuel to the fire. Third, accumulating conditions for restoring peace rather than further aggravating tensions. And fourth, reducing the negative impact on the world economy rather than undermining the stability of global industrial and supply chains. China is not a party to the Ukrainian conflict, but has consistently promoted talks for peace in its own way. China encourages and supports all efforts that are conducive to the peaceful resolution of this crisis and supports the holding in due course of an international peace conference that is recognized by both Russia and Ukraine and ensures the equal participation of all parties and fair discussions on all peace plans. China will maintain close communication with all parties concerned, including Germany, on this matter. What Xi Jinping is telling Schultz is you've got it all wrong. Instead of constantly abusing the Russians, you should moderate your rhetoric. Instead of sending arms 
to support Ukraine, you should stop sending arms to support Ukraine. You should instead be talking to everybody about sitting down and negotiating peace. Instead of seeking selfish gains, in other words, aiming to defeat the Russians in some way, you should understand that they have security interests that need to be taken into account and properly considered. And instead of imposing sanctions on the, Rus on the Russians, you should have lifted them because all that those sanctions are doing is undermining the stability of global and industri industrial and supply chains. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall whilst this meeting took place and whilst Xi Jinping gave this lecture to Scholz. I noticed that the Chinese have been careful to point out that the meeting took place in the Diayutai State Guest House in Beijing. In other words, despite many warm words from Xi Jinping about the good relations between China and Germany, the Chinese leader did not receive Olaf Scholz in the Great Hall of the People, the place where you would normally expect a leader of Scholz is importance to be received by the president of China. It seems to me that Xi Jinping lectured Scholz like Scholz was a naughty schoolboy, pointing out to Scholz that he reads, he's, needs to do his homework all over again because the homework that he's done is full of errors and mistakes. Well, as I said, a bruising encounter, no doubt expressed as always, as the Chinese always do, in their careful, moderate, incredibly polite, but nonetheless firm way. Even if you <laughs> disregard, however, the toughness of this readout and of what it says. Surely the logic of what Xi Jinping is saying is absolutely obvious. Ukraine is losing the war. The West can't turn it round. Ukraine is going to defeat. The article talks in Politico that the very survival of Ukraine as a nation now being in jeopardy. Surely the time has come to recognize that reality, to follow Scholz, uh, Xi Jinping's advice, to seek peace, to find out what the Russian peace plans are, to try to negotiate some kind of armistice or cessation of hostilities and convene a peace conference as soon as possible to try to find some kind of permanent resolution to this crisis in which Ukraine and the West understand that they're now going to have to make very substantial concessions indeed. Well, I don't expect Schultz to do that. I don't expect anybody in the United States to do that. If J.D. Vance was president of the United States, we might have sanity and reason return. But alas, he is not. So we're going to go careen forward towards defeat. There it is. I've been discussing this in program after program for the better part of two years now. Let's see what happens. Let's see whether Ukraine does go after the Crimean Bridge and how the Russians react. Let's see what happens on the front lines over the next few days. Let's also talk in the next program a very interesting speech that Dmitry Medvedev, Putin's deputy, has now given. And in the meantime, we still await and see what the Israelis are going to do. This is where I end my program today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and subscribe star. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop. You can find all the amazing things that we have there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. 
And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon.